Welcome everyone. It's so good to see you to the Davin for a Friend movement and our very special class every Wednesday, how to deepen your relationship with Hashem. This week I did a little trick and when I sent out the email, I just titled it how to deepen your relationships because that's at the heart of it. You know, Hashem doesn't need us to, to only look, uh, what did you say, Chana? In and up, but also here and now in our real daily life where we really live with each other and to build a world for him. So I did a little sneaky thing and just called it all relationships. And as we build with Hashem, we build with each other. So um, I see that there's a question over here. And whoever, Miriam, you asked a really good question, please ask that to me again at the end of class, because there's a lot that I want to deliver to you today, and I, I'm going to be staying on track. So here is my little heads up to all of you. I want to invite you into my heart space today, okay? The heart space looks like this. I'm buzzed with excitement, with delight, with passion, with movement. Because once again, we're at the beginning of the year. And we kind of have Rosh Hashanah at the beginning of the year, but that's really just getting warmed up. We're just crowning Hashem King. We're just getting our act together. Yom Kippur, we're still cleaning up our messes. We're still forgiving. And now it's Sukkot. And I don't know about you, but every year on Sukkot, I find myself pulling out old, old journals or spending time in the Sukkot, really like almost planning, like this whole year is in front of me. And this year in particular, um, the world is crazy. Yes, it is. And it's the year, just, I, I, I want to call it like the year towards Geula. It's not on me to say when Geula is, but it is definitely on me and on all of us to hold an intention, a big, giant, juicy, visual intention that this is the year, this can be the year. And when we say that, it's not a passive thing. It's not like, I think I'll wait around for like world healing to come. Uh-uh, we are the world healing. So our conversation today and going forward is, a, is, is really in that direction. Like, let's do this. Let's not, let's not talk about it. Let's not read about it. Let's actually do it in our real lives. Okay, that's my intention. Please Hashem, may he bring it soon and may he support all of us. And please, Hashem, bring a beautiful, beautiful healing to the women and to the men and to your whole world uh, through today's class. Okay. Ah, so last week, do you remember what we spoke about? How to step into your queenly self. Last week was all about um, learning to act, learning to step into this royal dimension. So wherever you are, just like sit up a little straighter. I love this thing, like when you can visualize your rib cage actually can be lifted. It's just like stand up a little taller. That's the physical manifestation. And in real life, speak more nicely with more kavod, be more measured. We can do this. We can, we can understand who we are as we walk in the world, ambassadors of Hashem. And this week, we're going to take it to the next step. Remember, we're building a brick by brick house for Hashem. And the next step is that we are a mamlachas kohanim v'gai kadosh. The literal translation of kohanim is not um, is actually a priest, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so we're literally like going into another dimension beyond royalty, and we're going to talk about that. But here's the scoop. Whenever we do work, we tap into the time, the spiritual time, in order to understand what is our work here? What's, what's here for us to work on? And what's here for us spiritually to drink from? There's special lights that come down with each holiday. And this holiday, this sentence is called Zman Simchasenu. It's the holiday of Sukkot, and Zman Simchasenu means it's the time of our happiness. Well, that, that's like a, that's a big statement. That's like a very big statement because I don't know about you, but nobody tells me when to be happy. No, like funny things make me happy and other things are very boring for me and other things are irritating to me when, um, you know, that just wouldn't bother somebody else. 
So like, how does it work that we have a time of being happy? It reminds me of when I was a little girl and I was always this anti, anti-leader, anti-follower, right? So we had these flickering lights, fluorescent lights in the classroom and the girls in the class, they would do this thing. They'd go like one, two, three, poof, because the lights would flicker and they would like poof enough times that suddenly the lights would go on. I'm looking like, what's everyone so excited about? It just like, it tickled me, it irritated me. What's like, what's the big deal? That's kind of like a little analogy. Like how does somebody get to tell you what makes you happy? Then there's like another question. What if you're annoyed? What if you get upset? How do you suddenly become happy? How does that work in practice? Like in theory, it's a time of our happiness. But in reality, there is um, a world pandemic. There's your health condition. There's your family dynamics. There is the weather. There is loss and grief and tumult in the world. There is your moodiness that can get just triggered in a minute because you are a human being, right? So how do we get back on track? How do we do this thing of being in Zaman Simchasenu? And this is actually a question for all the time. We, oh, we, it's like as we're starting to build this world brick by brick, we, we have to understand what, is, what does Hashem expect of us? Like, we're really supposed to like change our mood. You know, is that really possible with everything that's happening, with the things that tug at us, with the things that make us even angry or trigger us? And um, I know for some families, even just discussing what happens, what's going to happen on Cholamoe, that's triggering, you know trips that cost so much money or places that you can't go or children that are uh, not cooperating or even if you just are lonely and have nobody to go anywhere with or maybe you're in lockdown and you literally you can't get out like it's so triggering and yet we're commanded to be the simcha so um these are our two big questions what is sukkah is trying to teach us and how can we on a daily basis act in a way like what can what is the instruction that will help us to shift our mood okay i'm hearing a little bit of an echo do you guys hear that let me know anyone no okay we're all good wonderful you guys got the question oh my goodness the echo is horrible i'm gonna talk one more time hello hello sounds like a toy spinning okay we know what to do we take away our nice webcam and we do a not nice webcam. <clears throat> Give it a minute. There she is. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. I have to press pause. Please pardon me. One second, because I forgot to welcome everyone by name. I'm so okay, here we go. Hmm. So now this is when it gets really, really cool. Hashem knows us, yes. He knows us. He knows everything I just said. It's not a secret to him how easily it all flips, right? And yet, he knows something about us that we barely are aware of. And that is this. Check it out and listen carefully. Write this on your wall. We are and we are not human. There is a part of us that's very human. That part, it. It's not always honest. It feels fear. It rebels against Hashem. It complains. It blames. It hates. It's got like a like a ferociousness in there, like a self protection. It's me. It's about me. It's about my feelings, etc. But there's actually a superhuman part to us, an angelic part, and it's only because Hashem, who made us, knows about this angelic part of us that he gives us such difficult commandments. You understand? I mean, he's literally commanding us to be happy. What does that take? It means overcoming whatever trigger is in there and knowing something about ourselves that is, that is bigger than ourselves. I'll tell you a story 
that just happened with me. And my trigger, maybe you'll say, Rivka Maka, like, why did you get triggered by that? But I did. So here's what happened. Um, I took my children out. I thought I was being like super mom. I was in a great mood and it was like seven at night and this one wanted to go shopping and she doesn't need any more clothing. Trust me. No problem. I took her. Uh, we went far away to a store that she wanted. My other two girls also wanted to come. We're having a great time. Driving at night, we get there. Suddenly I see two of my girls talking. And what is it about? It turns out that one of them asked the other one of them if she could drive home that I shouldn't drive because why? My driving is so bad that it gave her an anxiety attack. <laughs> okay, so I'm like watching my girls discuss how I shouldn't be the driver and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm like, um, come to me. Well, what are, yes, I'm gonna be driving home. I had offered this person, this particular child to drive and she chose not to. I said, but you, you made me the driver. So now you got to be with my driving. Let's go. Like, I'm going to drive home. You don't go asking your sister, like to my face, behind my back. Like, could I drive? I was triggered. Now, listen, if somebody has anxiety about my driving, they have very good reason. I've been in so many car accidents. <laughs> I don't even drive long distance anymore. I try not to. They have very, very, very good reason. Particularly this child has an excellent reason, but it didn't matter. My human part came up totally self-protective. My ego was so not happy. I was all insulted and I, I felt disrespected. Like, don't talk about my driving. Anyway, so our beautiful outing starts to turn miserable. This is what the human part of us can do. Yes, guys, shake your head if you know what I mean. In a minute, the trigger comes up and like misery. So this little one who I got all upset and who's all full of anxiety is walking around the store like near tears and all this and I, it's miserable. So I go over to her and I say, hey, do you wanna talk about it? No, I don't wanna talk about it, talk, talk a little bit more. And I said, look, it just, you could have driven, but I, and I start reasoning with her. You could have driven, but I started to drive and you know, just I gotta drive back, you gotta work on this, whatever, not the best parenting. And then I took a deep breath, my friends. I didn't know I had it in me because I was so riled up. And with the, like I had this vision of my dear mentor in my mind and their kindness. And I took a deep breath and I just like put it away. <laughs> like, it's not even fun to be so human. It's just more trouble in my life. I just like breathed out the human, breathed in the angel. And I just said, you know what? I like literally stopped the conversation. I said, you know what? Would you like your sister to drive home? No, I'm not asking you that. I said, don't worry, you don't have to ask me. She can drive home, it's totally fine. And I understand, and this is so big for you. And here's a hug and let's go shopping. And I really get why, why you feel like this. Whoa, I'm giving myself a clap. You guys can clap also, thank you. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna have you guys give yourself claps um, towards the end of this talk. So I want you to think about um, your angelic parts and where you've overcome. And I have to tell you, it was such a kind of like a relief. It was a relief to be out of the drama of the heart that wants to flip on us and bring us down into this like very protective animal kind of place, you know, like a wounded animal. I'm not a wounded animal. I'm a grown woman and I can access my angelic. Yay, Miriam gave me an amazing, thank you so much. <laughs> breathe out the human, breathe in the angel, exactly. Okay, so let's continue. So let's take a look at why Sukkot especially is Zaman Simchasenu. And I'm going to call you to a beautiful, beautiful Pasuk in Tehillim that says, Ani, Tehillim is Psalms, Ani amarti Elohim atem uvne elyon kulchem. I said, angelic are you, sons of the Most High, are you all? Okay, drink that in. This is not just a talk, this is the truth right there, right there in Tehillim. It says, angelic are you. The truth of who you are is that you, you were built to overcome. You were built of strength and goodness. You, you, like you were built for the fight. You understand? You were built to rise. So why don't we? 
if we're so built to rise, what happens with us? Like happened with me on my beautiful trip to Burlington. What happens that like, boom, it just falls in an instant. And then you have to like climb back up. So there's actually a spiritual mechanism behind this. And I want us to remember this. I myself am imprinting this in my brain. It's so helpful. And it goes like this. What happened before Hashem said, Vayahi or let there be light? Into what did he speak to light? Put it in the chat box. You got it. Into the darkness. Total darkness is our default button because darkness precedes preceded light. Do you understand? It's so incredible. This means that your darkness is not something that you're manufacturing. There's nothing the matter with you. You're not like um you're not like uh broken and bad and angry and blaming and a not nice spouse and a not nice parent. Uh-uh. This is the design. The design is that unless we climb into the angel self, we are in the darkness. Okay? So I don't know about you, but to me that gives me, oh, and Rachel adds, and tohu vavohu, and chaos, and abyss. Yes. And someone says, psychology calls it the negativity bias. Yes. And Hannah says, I recently made peace with my sister after two years of not speaking. You're amazing, Hannah Baruch Hashem. By digging into my angel self, oh, Hannah. You are an angel. You don't even know what worlds you built by doing that. So the next time that something happens with you and you default to darkness, it's just like, yay. Do you know what's happening in that moment? You are going to get to emulate Hashem and say, via he or this is what my Aunt Celia used to say, a blessed memory. She was this tiny little, like four foot nine lady with like a firecracker personality and every time she'd turn on the light she'd say in a little russian accent that you he or yiddish accent and let there be light <laughs> she did not sound like that every time by a he or that's what it is you can bring the light into your experience and here's the difficult truth if you don't it won't be there it doesn't happen by itself so when we start on this year of victory, of building brick by brick for Hashem, we are gaining muscles. We are literally gaining spiritual muscles to, to build our angelic selves, to rise. And I have some more things to share with you. Ah, Randy says something. She says, angels don't have free will. We do. We can choose to be like angels calm and focused and full of Hashem's peace. I'm working on this lately. Mm, Randy, that's so incredible. And I love what you wrote over here. We are making the choice to be like angels. Like how incredible is that? To choose to rise to like, I, I think of it like, um, like a levitation, you know, like imagine that the, that you're standing on the ground and what you've got to do is you've got to lift off and leave those shoes on the ground. You know, on Yom Kippur, we don't wear shoes. We're like the angels. Just leave that, like, because we, we don't need that extra protection. We, we Like the angels. Just lift off, leave those shoes on the ground, those things that are meant for the dust and the dirt and the, the crumbs of, of humanism. Lift up. Let's be angelic. Um, <clears throat> we continue on. Okay. So what is special about Sukkot? Why is now Zman Simchasenu? Right? There's all kinds of holidays and all of them are so, so happy. So here's what it is. You know that the Sukkot represents the clouds of glory that surrounded the Jews in the desert. And these clouds were amazing. They were air conditioning in the desert and they, they protected the feet of the people as they walked and they protected from snakes and scorpions and they protected from enemies. They were literally like a hug of love from Hashem, this, this like physical imminence of Hashem, of his protection, of his love. They were not just like a vagabond, ragtag group of people walking through the desert, but uh, a treasured nation being carried through the desert, totally different. However, 
we lost it after we sinned with the golden calf. There was a time that we thought, oh my gosh, we have been so sinful. We've lost this, these clouds completely. Look what we have done. Look at the damage that we have done. But Hashem, in his mercy, he returned them to us when? On Sukkot. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever lost something really, really precious and important? Like a piece of jewelry? Oh, let me see something. I have this ring over here. See this ring? One day, I took my daughter to get her ears pierced. She wanted a second piercing. I did not want her to have a second piercing, but it was time, so we did it. Just a tiny little one. And as I'm leaving this space, I see this ring and I feel like this call in my heart, like almost like Hashem saying to me, I wanna buy that for you. Now, maybe someone will say, I wanna buy it for me and I'm blaming it on Hashem, but I like to think that everything's from Hashem. So got this little ring, I wore it and it's very hard for me to take care of rings. I actually lost my wedding rings like uh, four months after I got married. So I never wear rings. And then I got this ring, uh, maybe like, I don't know, uh, eight months ago. And I wore it and I wore it and I wore it and then I lost it, gone. And I, I was hurting so bad because I, I actually went back into this jewelry store to get it. And I bought it like a gift of love to myself from Hashem. It was special. And then gone. You know that feeling? Give me some head nods over here because it was awful. Like I'm not even sentimental, but I let myself be sentimental. And then, ouch. And I felt bad and I felt bad and I felt bad. And then about a week and a half ago. I had this like awesome tefillah in this very office. I walk out of my office and sitting, I'm going to cry right now because sitting on my bookshelf in front of all these children's books, just sitting there perched as if like an angel had put it there. Was it you, Miriam Chaya? <laughs> was my ring. Oh, it was Hashem. She said, that's what you're pointing. Was my ring. It got returned to me. Could you imagine? It just got returned. I, ah. That's the feeling. It's like the ring got returned. The, the clouds of glory are returned. This is amazing. That's how we feel. That's what we're tapping into on Sukkot, that you didn't leave us behind. You didn't forget about us. You didn't punish us. It's not lost. It's not gone. Yes, Hashem is with us. He loves us. Now, listen to this quote. It says in Devarim, for I shall raise my hand to heaven. And Rabbeinu Bachia says, okay, um, I'll, I'll read it to you. I was going to share the page. I'll just read it to you. Listen carefully. The promise of the redemption of the future is here being confirmed and reinforced with an oath, seeing that the gesture of raising one's hands towards the heaven is typical of someone swearing an oath. The Rambam, under the heading Derech Ha'emes, offers the following contribution seeing that at the time of the exile the Jewish people of the Jewish people God cast down the glory of Israel from heaven he now had to mention that he would pick it up with his hand and restore it to the celestial reasons once the time of goodwill towards the people of Israel returns let's translate that sometimes text can be a little chunky okay what does it mean that the pasuk says i shall raise my hand to the heavens it's like a promise what is this promise? This is the promise of Hashem that he will. Let me just see what is the promise. Seeing that, yes, Hashem himself, I have to see, is it us or is it Hashem? No, it's Hashem will raise his hand and restore us to the celestial reasons once the time of goodwill has returned. Okay, are we in the time of goodwill, my friends? Is this not the time of goodwill? What could Hashem, our Heavenly Father, say about a group of women, a group of people, a, a tour at any time, a YouTube that just like in their spare time gathers to, to grow, to listen? I mean, how could he not be crazy about us? Do you understand? How could he not be crazy about you? Look who you are. Look how you try every day, every single day in the darkness of this world, you get out there and you do kindness. 
and every single day you battle your inner negative messages again and again every single day you show up to life you work on your davening you work on amuna you're here now you accept your suffering whatever it is you're kind to your husband you're kind to your child. This is who you are. How could Hashem not be crazy about us? And you look at world events. Yes, it's time. There's major world events going on. I never like to talk politics. You can talk your own politics, but things are getting shook up really seriously. And who likes to talk pandemics? But Hashem does. Hashem says, wake up. The time for return is here. It's now. And do you know what I want to do? For you to know what I want to happen to my children, I want to raise them. And this is an opportunity that everyone has to go from humans and then from humans who act like queens to angels to the celestial regions. Now, celestial regions, it actually reminds me of this old movie I saw when I was a kid called the never ending story. It's an amazing, amazing story. Oh, Rachel, you saw it? What was that when I was a child? So basically, this boy who's like this little runt of a boy who gets thrown into the garbage dump on his way to school by all these bullies. He's late to class. They don't let him into class. He climbs into the attic of um, of the school and there he finds this book and he starts reading it and it's about this, this land that's going to be disappearing and there's this hero. And as he's reading this book, it takes you into the book. But slowly you realize, and I have the chills because it's so amazing. You could go watch this. It's a little PG movie back from the 80s or don't watch movies, whatever feels correct. Um, the, um, basically, I mean, if I says yes, um, yes, but I, I figure anything I, I ever have watched, like, let's put it to good use, yes? So this is to very good use because what this little boy starts to realize like he's resistant, he's resistant, but it just keeps making sense that his reading the book is affecting the world of the book. Like he's interacting with this character, his bravery, his, his willingness to be the hero is the only thing that will save that world. Like he's got to stop thinking that he's just a kid reading a book and realize that he is whatever his name is, you know, that's in this land actually affecting massive change through his very thoughts, okay? So when we talk about the celestial regions, it, it's very hard for us. We're so earthly. It's like we look up and we see a sky. What do we know about the places that our neshamas travel, our neshamas is our souls, about the effects that our actions have on the whole world? It's so hard for us to know. It's like we're, we're trapped in this attic, reading this book of our life, thinking that this is it. But meanwhile, what this Torah is telling us is that literally we will be raised to the celestial regions, meaning that our souls are going to travel higher and higher and higher. And we know that the soul and the body are interconnected. And therefore, this is not only a soul experience. Don't think that, oh, our souls are going to the celestial regions. That's very exciting. No, then it comes back and it affects our consciousness. Then it affects our prayer. Then it affects the peace in our heart. Then we can hear Hashem talk more clearly and loudly to us. We literally become earthly celestial beings. So, that is um, where we're going to stop, I think. Give me one more minute. I'm going to see if there's something that we're going to add. It's not good to give too much at once because then we, we, can, lose, um, we can lose more than we gain. We want to make sure to, to hold on to this. Okay. We're going to stop right here. We're going to wrap up with our final thoughts over here. So um, our final thoughts are like this, an invitation to you to be angelic, an invitation to please report on your angelic behavior, to inspire us with your moments of victory. 
please inspire us with your moments of victory. Some are relational, like I mentioned with my daughter, and some are internal. But each time we step into our angel self, we are, we are going closer to Geula. We're doing what we're always meant to be doing. And it's time that Hashem wants this for us. We're not in a time of drudgery. Life is not so, so physically taxing. It's emotionally and spiritually demanding because that is the platform for our work. So the next time frustration or irritation comes, the next time someone says something to you that makes you feel so terrible, what can you do? What can you do? Remember, first we hold ourselves, okay? There's nothing happens unless you're loving and gentle to yourself. Nothing happens. Nothing happens without love. First, gentle towards yourself. And then in that gentleness, to give yourself the honor of knowing that there's something here for you to rise to. And in that rising, the next thing that you can do, and I urge you to do this, is to tell on yourself. Don't keep it to yourself. When you tell on yourself, you can do a few things. I'll tell you what I do. You can tell a friend, here's my awesome victory. Or sometimes I tell Hashem. I say, Hashem, look what I just did. Look what I just did. And uh, my daughter, she did an awesome angelic thing the other day. She bought on our trip a Tommy Hilfiger dress. It was so cool. And it was not quite covering her knees, almost. And I was like, don't buy it if we're not gonna, if you're not gonna want me to fix it. We bought it, brought it home. You know, I would add some material to make it more modest. And um, next day she came to me, she handed me this like beautiful dress. It was so sporty and adorable. She just handed it to me. She's like, I'm not gonna do it. I'm not gonna wear it, I'm not gonna do it. Mm -mm. I said, sweetheart, you made a carbon for Hashem. A carbon means a sacrifice, but do you know what that means? I told her, I don't know if she was listening, but I was listening. I said, a carbon is a sacrifice, and it's the same word as karov, close. You just got closer to Hashem. He wants you to look elegant and modest, and now you're saying, like, yeah, I want to be close to you. That's how I want to show up, just like you want me to, Hashem. So beautiful. So um, I digress with that story. I was so proud of her. But the, the point over here is tell on yourself. Oh, I know why. Because when we give up our humanism and step into a more angelic space, I believe that we have a closeness to Hashem, a proximity, and an opportunity to ask him in, in, from a place of closeness and love. Not like, I did this for you, now you did this for me. But from a place of like, Hashem, I overcame this because you wanted me to. And now that I'm so close, so much closer to you, Please can I ask you X, Y, Z? Or please can you let me feel your love more? Or please can you heal me? Or whatever it is that is in your communication with Hashem. Like use it. Let it, let it, let yourself not just feel like I did this hard thing. You know, no, it deserves to be celebrated. Um, it deserves to be like um maximized because you're literally building the world and building yourself. So from now on. I am speaking to a group of angels, and I know that, and I am going to uh, answer your questions now, and I'm going to ask you, Rachel, who is amazing at this, or Hannah, in case Rachel can't come, that next week we want to start, and it won't be recorded unless you are okay with it being recorded, but we want to start with our angelic victories, okay, whether it's forgiving someone or doing kindness, I have all the time in the world. Like nothing would make me happier than to sit here and hear your victories and celebrate with you um, or send them to me by email. It's Rif Kamalka at Juma. I want to hear, I want to like partner with you in building these bricks for Hashem. Okay. Um, let's take, uh, first of all, I love you all. I appreciate your being here. Every week I ponder how deeply this class is for me. So like, I'm growing, and I thank you for participating in that, and I, I just thank you so much for being here, for being you, and I'm excited to read your comments. I'm going to go back now. Okay. 
Amanda, you gave me a beautiful comment today. Thank you. Miriam Carr has an important question. She says, could you address women on Simcha's Torah in terms of expressing our love of Hashem and the Torah and dancing with the Sifri Torah like men? What is the unique women's way? I think that's a wonderful question, Miriam. And I, it resonates with me a lot because just for our audience over here, um, for many, uh, Simcha's Torah is a holiday, it's a one-day holiday where um, the activity is dancing with the Holy Torah and this dancing and this like, you know, very joyful, noisy celebration takes place on the men's side and the women watch. And I have to tell you, uh, for most of my life, this was a very difficult experience. It was a confusing experience. It was an alienating experience. I didn't know what to do with myself. I'm not much of a watcher. I'm more of an experiential person. And I had, I had times when I was upset and times when I wouldn't go to shul and times when I made beautiful peace. And so um, as I sit here today with you, Miriam, I ask Hashem to put the words in my mouth. Mm. Okay, here, here's what I feel. I'm going to speak for myself, Miriam, because I don't know where you're coming from. When I was in that place of feeling like, hey, what about the women? We're left out. I don't like this. And people would tell me all kinds of intellectual reasons and answers. None of them did it because I was asking the wrong question. Embedded in this question was this gullus mentality that women are lower. So if women are lower, then standing there watching the men is like, yeah, all the activity takes place on the men's side and we don't get part of the action. Mm -mm. But if we realize the sacred, incredible role of the women to receive, to to be supported by, then we realize that the men are dancing for us. They're dancing because of us and they're dancing for us. In my shul, there is a, in my old shul, there, there is a legend. I wasn't there to witness it, but the, so I'm calling it a legend, but it says that the women were very upset that they couldn't dance. And so they went downstairs and they danced in their own circles. And what happened on the men's side? The dancing slowed down considerably. It became very, very weak. Underneath the, the physical consciousness of we're dancing with the Torah is the super consciousness of we're dancing for the women. And it's not for the women in any base way. It, it's like our receiving of this experience is what makes the experience. It's very much like I went to this, um, I went to this wedding once where the rabbi had to explain to the crowd about the Jewish proceedings. So he said to the crowd, when I make a blessing, you say amen. He said to them, it's like theater. The audience matters as much as the actors. Without the audience, there's no show. So when I say a blessing, it's not just me. I want everyone to say amen. And now that completes the blessing. It was such a beautiful explanation. So the same is with our relationship to Torah, is that our on that day, what is highlighted is that our receiving of it is what is what brings it to life. Yes? If you wrote a book that was never published, is, is the book alive? Or is it just a journal? Is it just a diary? It's not. So um, that is, that's where I stand today. And I don't know what, what Simchas Torah will look like, you know, in, in future times or if there will be a Simchas Torah. But I know that for many women, it is ripe for distortion and terrible, terrible feelings. And my invitation to myself and to anyone who wants to over here is to step into your angelic self and recognize what a prize you are to be this queenly feminine receiver that your mere gaze, just your gaze upon 
This dancing energizes it. Just your gaze, how powerful is that? That means that your love and appreciation is what makes this thing come to life. And I've been thinking about this so much, not this, I appreciate the opportunity to think about this, but I've been thinking about the word receive so much because it's a very feminine thing. And this whole like getting of the Torah is called Kabbalah Satorah, receiving the Torah. Like it's all in the receiving, all of it. Um, so what is a woman's unique way? A woman's unique way is to, is to be a woman, is to honor herself and to not, not need to be a man and to know how beautiful that is. Okay. Um, thank you, Hashem. That feels good to me. Miriam, let me know in the chat box how that feels to you. Okay. Welcome, for Beth from New Hampshire. And thank you, everyone here for these amazing messages. I'm, I, the ones that are not questions, after I stop the recording, I read them so that I could take in all this gorgeous love. And here we go. Just a few more. I have a question. If I can focus on all the infinite good that Hashem gives me, which is way beyond the amount I could ever enumerate or write, wouldn't I then feel so besimcha and realize how fortunate I am and how even though what hurts is valid, it's small compared to the incredible good he gives me? That's huge. That is an incredible tool to focus on gratitude. And do you know what, my darling? You added the missing piece to our talk because I actually forgot to say that. Yes, gravity, darkness is the default button, but gratitude is the way into the angelic self. Absolutely. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, notice what makes you happy. And it's like when you're unhappy, you don't even always know why you're unhappy. But when you're happy, you know why. You could say, yeah, I'm so happy my friend came over. So when you like open up gratitude, yes, yes, yes. That's exactly how to climb out of the darkness into the angelic place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Never be shy to write your comments. We're learning here together. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Such good comments here and private comments. I appreciate you. Thank you. And we're almost done. Amanda has a report over here. I lost my phone last week, Tuesday. I couldn't find it all night. I felt vexed. That's a cool word, Amanda. Finally, an hour before our class last week, it was found. I feel it was hidden from me to show me to be in the moment, not to be so, so consumed with the thing. Before bed Tuesday, I realized I was behaving irrational looking for it. I stopped, showered, and readied for bed and didn't allow it to bother me. One minute. Oh no, lose my way. I didn't allow it to bother me. Such a big lesson. Yeah, that's like Hannah's lesson. You went to the here and the now. You surrendered it. When Hashem wants you to find it, you're gonna find it. You got the claps. Thank you. Um, Okay, so the person who asked me a question privately, is it okay if I read the question out loud? Okay, I have a really deep question. We want to be humans who keep Hashem's Torah and mitzvot and do His will, and we want to be malachim, that's angels, in a way, and overcome our physical needs. I was anorexic, not because I cared so much about how my body looked, but more because I wanted to negate the physical, and to gain control over my chaotic life. So how do we understand the discrepancy between wanting to be human-like and angelic? Unbelievable question. Let's hop into the answer. So um, first of all, my deepest compassion for the time that you were anorexic, and it sounds like you're out of it, and I'm so grateful. So being human, and being an angel are two very different experiences, okay? Human beings have bodies. That's what we have. We are souls in bodies. And it's because we have bodies that we have free will. Now we have choices. We get hungry, what should we eat? We, we gotta wear something, what should we wear? The physicalness of our 
selves is part of what gives us free choice, okay? Therefore, the body is so important to our avodah Hashem, to our service of God. The more I work on my internal service, the better I take care of my body. It says that, um, I remember this, I think it was an old medrash that like, you know, some kind of like praises the one who kind of like cleans the statues in the palace of the king. And that was like an analogy to our body. Like you don't want dusty statues in the palace of the king. You want radiant, shiny, well-maintained um, statues in the palace of the king. So just to address your question on, on two levels, one on a philosophical level, taking care of the body, enjoying the body, having pleasure in the body, these are godly, gorgeous things. Godly and gorgeous. Not to be confused with being spiritual. That is spiritual. That is the here and now. Like, there's always this question, how do I know what should I do, God? There's so many choices. And he's like, well, sweetheart, whatever I put in front of you, it's not that hard. Like, I'm like, should I go save the world or take care of my kids? Well, who's in front of you? <laughs> there you go. So um, should I like take care of my health or, you know, start a new organization? Well, how's your health? You know, it's not such rocket science. He's not here to trick us. So the body's needs are so important. And the body, it's gotten a very bad rap. Pro mostly because of like very secularized, um, it's not secularized, but like I, not Jewish ideas about the physical and the spiritual. So let's just lay it out right here, right now. The Jewish idea about the physical is that it is glorious in its elevation. When it's used for bad, then it is like an animal. When you use the body for good, it's like an angel. And so, um, Eat beautifully, sleep beautifully, exercise beautifully, moisturize beautifully, loofah beautifully, um, stretch beautifully, breathe fresh air beautifully, rest beautifully, um, get a massage beautifully. All of this is holiness to the max. And it's so obvious to see that when a person is anorexic and trying to get control of their life, at that very same time, they feel so cut off, so despised by Hashem. So out of, out of sync, you know, and when a person is very, very overweight and feels like so not good in their body, they have a question about themselves with Hashem, about their worth. Maybe they're just here to be used. Maybe they're just here to be functional. Maybe they don't intrinsically matter. Like just as a person, when we take care of our body, it's literally like it's self-love. It's saying I matter and Hashem wants us to know that. So yeah, my, I, I added in more self-care this year, and I plan on adding in more self-care. I just started getting up earlier because whatever, it takes time to take care of the physical self. Um, Miriam says, how do you all of a sudden be an angel? For me, it is a decision. I know that I want connection, so I choose it. For me, it was a decision to pray and see the good in another and bring nachas to Hashem, and it was the most exalted feeling I was able to live the moment and joy. Yes, Miriam, you're doing it. You're doing the choosing. Clap, clap, clap. Yeah, you're literally like lifting out of those feet every time. I wish I had like more science background because, but like somebody here does. Like, what is that? What is that like force? Like it takes so much force and momentum to, un, to undo a pattern. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Like if, if Miriam didn't choose to be an angel, she would just, she would just go, you know, like we go. But she like, she interrupted her humanity. She interrupted that groove to create another, a new groove. Ah, it's so excited. exciting. Um, and let's just see, is there anything else? I love these. Um, what about Miriam's dance at the Yamsuf? Beautiful. So Miriam's dance at the Yamsuf, I the way I understand it, is very much linked to her song, where it says that how did Miriam and the women dance in parallel to the men? I, in Judaism, we hold, we understand that a woman's voice is her deepest innocence. 
and that is so sacred and it's meant only for her most beloved and intimates and you know you won't see an orthodox woman on stage singing to a mixed crowd it's like an intimate sharing and it's just for the women so what does that mean that the women all sang and danced in front of the men yes they reached a level where it was nothing to do with the physical it was all raised up and i have some torah and psukim if you want if it's important to you that i can kind of um that i can get for you because i remember reading about this um but it's it's very very much the truth that they were be they were in their angelic selves completely and when is there a time for outward expression oh miriam your questions are so amazing so um two two pieces for you over here one piece is that i long for the day where there will be more women's gatherings right now we have a lot of men's gatherings and we know that when women gather together like it's like like the gula gathering once upon a time it's like rocket ship fuel they don't even have to do so much maybe they say some to him here or there but like it's rocket ship fuel when the women gather together so I long for the day when there's more of that and there is becoming more of that and now we're all quarantined so there's less of that again but it is so important for women to gather together and it also allows us to be more natural than we can be in mixed settings like there's so much expression that needs to happen and I just pray that we have more of it and that's the goal and then the other part of it is this my experience has been that the deeper one gets in connection with Hashem, the more they can experience what can feel like an outward expression without having an audience. So that Hashem is the audience. I know women who sing in their car. Oh my gosh, I have to tell you about that. Sing in their car, dance while they pray, write like tons of poetry to Hashem as, as Hannah just displayed to us. There's actually so much expression in this intimate space and it's extremely satisfying because it's not limited by modesty. It's like, it's raw, it's real, it's deep, it's holy, and it doesn't need an audience. Now I have to tell you this one crazy thing. This changed my life. So a friend of mine, her, her Rav had to go to a uh, Makobol. Makobol is like a mystic about her. And when he gave my friend's name to this mystic who had never met her, he said to her, this woman, he said, pardon me, yeah, he said to the Rav, this woman sings to God in her car. Blew me away. Now, I know that when I talk, Hashem listens, but I guess I didn't know it all the way because suddenly I realized, my friend's doing her thing, driving carpool, singing in the car. It's literally echoing in the heavens so loudly that this mystic in who knows where hears it, knows it. It's real. Every time you dance for Hashem, it's a show up in heaven. Like, it's real. I know it's so obvious. Like, we live this truth because it's real. But when I heard this, I was like, oh, my goodness. So you do have an audience for this outwards expression, like a real, a real, really appreciative audience. Um, and every word you say, it is being listened to. Um, <clears throat> oh, thank you for all these beautiful comments. Thank you. I can't wait to read them. You're writing such amazing things. The, Erica says, the men are a witness to the women of future generations where their husbands should come from. The men who like... Um, David danced in the presence of the Lord. Yes. Rivka says, I saw from Dr. Rabbi Abraham Torsky that we read Kohelis, reminding us that what we have is Hevel Habalim, that everything is emptiness, so that we realize that if we focus on what's important to serve Hashem, this brings us true happiness for this Chag. What's important is to serve Hashem. Yep, that's all there really is. Um, Someone asked me, if, if the more we work on our service with Hashem, the more we take care of our bodies, why are so many holy rabbis very overweight? That is because, well, I don't want to speak for the holy rabbis because I know some people eat in unbelievable holiness and maybe like um, this like weight is almost like a disguise, like a protection against the pain of the world. Did you know that? Weight, act, like you know how your hormones, they work in 
harmony or they work together with your metabolism, with your mood, with your food, so that somebody who's depressed can put on weight, even eating the same amount of food as somebody who's not depressed. Food is not only about caloric intake, how it interacts with your body is a very big, um, it's a true thing, it's connected to your emotional state. So for example, last year I was doing a lot of deep healing and I was 20 pounds more. I did not go on a diet since then. I took better care of myself because I love myself more. So I'm like choosing more carefully, but no, I was 20 pounds more. And those 20 pounds, we call it, it, it is, it's a protection. So some people have 20 pounds of protection, 60 pounds of protection because of the emotional pain that they're carrying. So there's a two part answer, but this is just one thing to offer you is that weight actually is a buffer. And sometimes we hold on to weight because it's not time to release it. And for sure, if there is a great rabbi who is carrying so much pain of the people, his, his being will react to that. He can't be a lightweight, so to speak. He cannot be a lightweight. That's in one dimension that is a, a very interesting truth. I mean, I weight has been a topic my, my whole life. So it's like really fascinating for me to, to understand this and to, to see this. Um, Rabbi, say Rabbi Kellerman talks about the interaction of your mood and while you eat, etc. Okay, put that on the side. That's a very real thing. If you see that someone is very overweight, know that they're in pain. And this is part of their protection. It's not that they are in pain because they're overweight. They're, they're in pain and therefore they're overweight. Step one. Step two. This is very, very exciting. One is comforting, one is exciting. The fact that we're meant to look radiantly healthy and take incredible care of ourselves is one of the last stops in the Geula process, in the redemption process. It's one of the last stops. That's why I have such joy and admiration when I see Rabbi Laser Brody, who's in his 70s, who spent years teaching Amuna and now has gone back to his roots where he was an IDF paratrooper and a fitness coach. And here's this rabbi, you can look him up and he's showing, this is how you do push-ups and sit-ups. And he's been doing this while he's been teaching, but he, he's just like, he gives out this Torah about taking care of the body. Why is the body the last stop of redemption of this world healing? because it's like the light is coming lower and lower. Now it's time for the world, the actual world, to be a place where Hashem can live. Our bodies are a micro world, a microcosm of the world. So um, it used to be that we would just like, spirituality would happen up here in the head or in a prayer book. No, now it's deeper and deeper. Now is the time to to let Hashem into every corner, into every bite of corn on the cob, to know Hashem is in there. He's in the corn on the cob. He's, he's energizing you through this. You know, he's in the tenderness of your hand when you put cream on your face. He's in, he's in the delicious warm shower. He's with you and proud of you when you work out your muscles, when you take care of your muscles, that, they're, that you're not weak that you're not just walking around um, dragging through life. When you exercise it, it gives you vitality. Um, and this taking care of ourselves, it has a continuum for some, we're gonna finish here, by the way. Um, I don't wanna keep you. Um, for some of us, it is just the beginning. Like I gotta start taking more showers or eating a little bit better or eating at all. Some people don't feed themselves. They just put themselves last. Um, I got to put on a nice tickle, a nice scarf. Amanda doesn't eat. That's not good. Eat, feed yourself. It's nourishing. There's just like so much neglect. And then there's like a little bit more on the continuum. Taking more gentle showers, more like nourishment, more loving kindness in your treatment of yourself, spending some time in the sun and the fresh air, like getting in that vitamin D. I once uh, had a Torah learning partner who did her entire PhD on the uh, problems that come about because we don't have vitamin D. Most people don't have enough. Fascinating. Then it continues on. Can you stretch? Can you do some yoga or whatever stretching you like? Can you exercise? Whatever feels good to you, don't ignore the body. And it is indeed such a struggle. It's the final stop. The final stop 
in your in the Gu'ulu process is the physical, and the final stop in your healing process is your family. Okay. I grew up being told, I understand that you might need to go. My family is horseback riding, and I told them I can't go, so I got to give this class. So my house is empty, and I'm going to keep on answering questions to the best of my ability if Hashem gives me words to say. Um, but if you do need to go, I, I do understand. Okay. I grew up being told that my grandparents were brought here from terrible poverty and violence and managed to go to high school first in the family. Their kids, my parents, were the first to go to college and had to support their families financially and make every decision about what to do based on that. Wow. They said, my generation is the first to not have to worry about money. And my job is to help the world. And to, I'm missing this, something about having a child. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, one second. It's skipping a line here. My job is to help the world and to have something about having a child who my spouse now mostly has to care for due to my fatigue. There was no sense of order in caring for self, first family, second, the rest of the world after that. Oh my gosh, Michelle, yes. What an interesting thing that we struggle with. There's this sense of mission. We want to contribute to the world and yet, what about the self? Here we are saying, put your self-care first. And what about this competing message of, it is time to save the world, bring the redemption, care for your community. Oh my goodness. Okay. It's very, it's just a truth. It's a human truth. We have to take care of ourselves first. It's our limitation. We don't like it. We'd rather be superhuman. We feel guilty. We feel not enough. We feel selfish. Sorry. It's just the truth. It's, it's the responsibility. There's nobody who can take care of you like you. Like your needs, like nobody can do exercise for you. You can't pay someone to just do the exercise. You can't pay someone to take a nap. Oh, could you take a nap for me? Sorry. You have to do it. So yourself is always going to come first. Even if the macro message is, you know, do for the world, that's based on the assumption that you love yourself. So it could very well be that it's time to scale back. And I will share with you that my family had a big value around having guests. We had guests every week from the second week that we got married for hmm, maybe like 16 years, every single week, besides for. No, just every single week. <laughs> Shabbos came, we had guests. We didn't even know that there's such a thing as not having guests. And then the children got a little bit older and we decided one week to uh, give them some time. And we had this family meal, no guests. I was like, one minute. This was so gorgeous. I remember going to my rabbi the next day at a kiddush and I was like, this is a secret that I never knew about. The children, we spoke to the children. The whole time, it was peaceful. I wasn't running back. This is like a this is a massive secret breakthrough breakthrough that I did not know about. And so we started not having guests on Friday night. That was how we took care of ourselves, of our family first. Like it was in it was in contra in, indication to this whole like value that I had about giving, realizing give at home first, and then some years later. When my husband and I were doing a lot of healing, we were, we were down and out. We were hurting. We didn't have extra energy, and we really stopped having guests for a good couple of years. And didn't nobody would believe it. Like I'm teaching them out. I'm doing stuff, but sorry, I need a lot of. I need to re restore. I just needed to restore. Then came Corona, so um, I think afterwards we're we're getting ready. Um, so please take care of yourself. And this is the final thing I want to say about that. Don't be scared of the loss. When, you, when something is hurting you, it's an indication from Hashem that it is time to reset it. Don't keep doing the same thing that hurts you. So let's say you run an organization for Save the Whales and you're like, if I don't run this organization, everything will collapse. But I'm burnt out and I'm getting adrenal fatigue or something when my family's suffering, but the whales are going to suffer. They have to do it. I'm the only one who can run the office. 
if it's hurting you, it's literally your indicator that something is off. And if you let it go and go back to the basics, which is eat, sleep, and exercise, family and love, then you will not lose and the whales won't lose because the whales, the world, it was never your job in the first place. It's Hashem's to take care of. And for a time, he offered you the opportunity to contribute there. But it's Hashem's organization, Hashem's job, and nothing's going to happen when you leave. I, had a, I was the director of an outreach organization for young professionals, and my daughter needed me at home. It was getting crazy. She was following me to the office. One day I quit. And um, what happened next is after about a year, the whole organization ended. Okay. That's what happened. It just didn't go on. They hired someone. She, she wasn't as like, you know, um, like I would work like serious hours because I was so passionate. She had like really good boundaries. So it was just like minor and beautiful and, and it was over. And that's exactly what it was meant to be. It was meant to be in existence for those few years. It's not mine to hold. Mine to hold is what's in front of me. Um, I'm going to be Wasn't Miriam's dancing before most of the rules about this were handed down? Um, yes, but rules of modesty are, were always intrinsic to the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, still struggling with feeling guilty for giving to myself. I would rather do for others a million times over. Yes, that's a deep struggle from a deep, deep inner belief from when, most likely, from when you were a child about the type of love you deserve to have. But my darling, nobody can give you that love that you can because you know what you need. You know what your body needs. You know what delights you. And so the thing is that when we don't give ourselves what we need, we feel miserable in the world. Like the world stops being our friend because um, we're miserable, <laughs> you know, because we're not so happy. So it's, it's really our responsibility to take care and to nurture. Um, I'm going to press pause over here. I know some people have to leave. We're having such a wonderful time, but my soup is burning. Hang on just a minute. Okay. Here, Riff is looking gorgeous. Yeah, awesome. Okay. Ah, let's go down. That was not a tired sigh. Um, what about the desire to inspire other women in dance, song, etc.? You um, should follow that desire all the way, all the way, and do not hold back. Um, it is part of the redemption process. Um, you can read the book, Kabbalistic Writings of the Masculine and Feminine, to really get into this very deeply, but it's part of the redemption process for the women to rise to their wholeness. And it's not going to happen until we do. And women need to dance and sing. We need to. And we need women who will lead us. And please follow that to the end. Do not stop. I give you every bracha in your dream that you should make awesome, incredible gatherings of women. Like so much joy and happiness. I know when we used to do retreats, uh, second night was always a dance party. Just amazing. Okay. Someone says, I sing my tefillos, although I don't sing on tune, and I feel like I connect more to Hashem. Oh, that's so gorgeous. Okay. Rachel, may I read your comment? There's also a concept that our bodies, unlike other levels of health, like spiritual, emotional, and psychological, we did not get to choose. We were born into it, and as such, is much more challenging to appreciate. It has always been there with us and for us. This makes it more difficult to recognize as something separate and therefore requiring as much attention and self-care as those aspects. Um, sorry, we have chosen. Yeah, that's really interesting. Wow. Maybe that's why the deeper you get into the soul work, the more you can take care of the body because you stop getting confused that you are the body. That's a super cool idea. That, that tickles me. Thank you, Rachel. Is there a way to fix not being happy on Sukkot retroactively? I feel that I was unsuccessful during the first part of Yom Tov because someone was not being so nice, but I don't want to lose out on the specialness of being happy on Sukkot, and it's almost the end. Oh, my gosh. I love that question. It's so gorgeous and sincere. 
And the answer is a resounding yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the Hasidus teaches that the greatest light is in the darkness. It's only that the light is so great that it has to be hidden. So if you had a dark first days, do you know what kind of light, what kind of potential is sitting here before you? Now when you're going to be happy at the end of Sukkot, it's going to be, you're choosing to be happy. It's not going to be like, yeah, la-di-da, I'm in a good mood, love my new, you know, yantif dress. It's literally, I want to be close to Hashem. I want to be in gratitude. I want to maximize Sukkot. I'm doing this because I want to. And when that means that in the space where there was no relationship, so to speak, or a gap in the relationship, you're filling it because there was a gap, which means that the gap is part of the being filled right now. Whenever you do tshuva me'ava, it makes everything into a mitzvah. Oh, yes. And I bless you, please Hashem, that you should have such a beautiful uh, last few days of sukkahs. Do you have any experience with what you can do when you fall into collapse, when you're so sad and hopeless that you cannot get yourself to physically move? Do you maybe have an insight on what might help in this state? Thanks for considering. Um, so we all know that this, this person who wrote over here is really going through a very hard time as she, she has been really going through a big, big, difficult healing process. Every week we get to hear from her. And the reason why I say that is because my answer is specifically for her where she's at and knowing the work that she's done already. And that is that um, if you feel that you're in collapse, Lydia, then if you can just be gentle on yourself and turn to Hashem and let him take care of it more right now, instead of like rushing for this thing to be over or rushing for it to get fixed or rushing to feel better. I feel that that will um, be a more constructive way for you to carry yourself. You didn't cause this. You can't control it. It's a wound that has to heal in your heart. And so it's really connecting to Hashem, asking him to heal you and then being a good messenger of him and taking good care of yourself, okay? And along the way, you'll find some spaces where you could maybe um, could learn from what you did to do things differently or get an insight onto the, the hurting of your heart that contributed to that situation. And you can, you know, you can grow that part, et cetera. But for your answer today, if you're talking about collapse, it's claps into Hashem's arms and just do whatever you can. Write to him, talk to him, yearn to him. And um, if there is anyone that wants to be a WhatsApp support to Lydia, maybe you can have a little buddy system so that someone can be in this with you. Okay, uh, Lydia, you can feel free to reach out to anyone on this class. And anyone on this class can say, um, yes, I'm available or no, I'm not available. Okay. Ooh, Rachel says, if you don't make time for your wellness, you will be forced to make time for your illness. Oof. Um, that's a quote. Some great conversations I'm going to read. And um, I think I'm going to read these like gorgeousness. Okay. Um, let me just see it hopped to the top. I missed all the bottom messages. Okay. Um, that's it for today. Wishing all the angelic women an awesome sukkahs. And thank you, Hashem, for letting us have this extended time together. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. It's so great to have you here. I'm going to read your comments. That gives me pleasure.